أعلم بما وضعت وليس الذكر كالأنثى وإني سميتها مريم وإني أعيذها بك وذريتها من الشيطان الرجيم وقال النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم إن مما يلحق المؤمن من عمله وحسناته بعد موته علما علمه ونشره وولدا صالحا تركه أو مصحفا ورثه أو مسجدا بناه أو بيتا لابن السبيل بناه أو نهرا أجراه أو صدقة أخرجها من ماله في صحته وحياته تلحقه من بعد موته أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Honorable scholars, respected brothers and elders, it is an accepted fact without fear of contradiction that there is no joy like the joy on the achievement of one's child. There is no joy that a person can experience greater than the joy, the happiness, the jubilation, the excitement that would grip a parent on the achievement and on the excelling of his son. And in the same breath and in the same vein, there is no pain and there is no hurt greater than the pain and the hurt on the failure, on the deviation and on the mistake of one's child. This is such a sentiment that even the Sahaba were not exempted of and even they were not free of this. The famous hadith appears in Bukhari Sharif when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gathered the Sahaba and he said, إِنَّ مِنَ الشَّجَرِ شَجَرَةٌ Inna min ash-shajari shajaratun Amongst the trees that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created There is one particular tree Wahiyya mithlul muslim In many ways this tree resembles a believer So this tree has the traits, the qualities The identification of a believer Haddithuni ma hiya Nabi Sassam Asked the sahaba a question And he engaged them with a quiz and he asked them, tell me which is this tree? There is a particular tree from all the trees in the forest and the jungles that Allah created. Now it is human nature, when someone asks us a question, we seldom think of the simple answer. We always think of the most complex answer. So something peculiar, strange, uncommon, unheard, remote, scientific. The common basic one we never think of. فَوَقَعَ النَّاسُ فِي شَجَرِ الْبَادِيَةِ So the Sahaba started thinking amongst the forests and the trees and the jungles. أَمَّا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بْنِ عُمَرْ فَكَانَ يَعْلَمُ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ But there was a young Sahabi by the name of Abdullah ibn Umar رضي الله عنه. He knew exactly, precisely what Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was speaking about. مَا مَنَعَهُ مِنَ الْإِجَابَةِ إِلَّا حَدَاثَةُ سِنِّهِ The only thing that prevented him from answering that there was eminent and there was prominent sahaba like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Abdullah ibn Umar was a young boy. Now look at the youth of sahaba and what was the jazbah of the youth of sahaba that this is a young boy. He has the correct answer and he has confidence in his correct answer. But respect of the senior sahaba doesn't allow him to speak. Our youngsters got the wrong answer and they blurt first. Our youngsters got the wrong answer and they blurt in first. Abdullah ibn Umar has the correct answer. So everybody applied their mind and they exhausted their thinking. And when they could not understand, they could not understand. They said, Ya Rasulullah, haddithuni ma hiya. O Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we don't know. Hands up, tell us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna han nakhla. That's a simple thing. It is your date palm. Inna han nakhla. You know, I remember the late Mufti Mahmoud Sahib, Rahimahullah, no warallahu marqadahu, Allah fill his grave with nur. One day he was visiting South Africa and we know he passed away there also. I had the good privilege of attending his janazah. It was at that one particular time in my life that I had seen where the entire grave was filled without using one spade. Everybody had lined up and people had taken sand in their hands and done this year. And in, in doing that alone, the entire grave was filled. 
Not one spade was used. I seen this with my own eyes. I was studying and it was in our final year. In fact, we were in the dars of Bukhari when the news came. Just one thing of his came to mind. That someone asked him this question where the Prophet ﷺ said, تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعٍ لِمَالِهَا وَلِجَمَالِهَا وَلِحَسَبِهَا وَلِدِينِهَا فَضْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتْ يَدَاكِ It's a famous hadith. We've heard it on many instances. The Prophet ﷺ said, A woman is generally married for one of four reasons. Sometimes for her wealth, sometimes for her piety, sometimes for her lineage, sometimes for her beauty. The Prophet ﷺ says, Hasten in securing her piety. فَضْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتْ يَدَاكِ now, anybody who has studied Arabic grammar will know, Taribat Yadak is in the context of what we would say, woe be to you, silly of you, nasty of you, you know, in the context of something that is like, how foolish of you, how foolish of you. So someone posed this question to him, and he said, the Prophet ﷺ is exhorting us in this hadith to secure the piety, and then he uses the word Taribat Yadak, what's the tie between the two? When there is exhortation towards piety, why does the Prophet ﷺ conclude this particular hadith by using the phrase, may your hands be soiled. That's the little, literal translation. So then he explained in his eloquent way and he said, may your hands be soiled, don't you understand such a simple and clear thing that piety should take preference. When you're looking for a woman... Then everything else should be one side, priority should be over her piety. So the Prophet ﷺ, when they applied their mind and applied their mind and they exhausted, he said, Inna nakhla. What's there that you're applying your mind? It's your date palm. The date palm that you see daily. And obviously, this was exposed to them, and that's the beauty of the Quran. When we give da'wah to someone, then it's important we learn how to give him da'wah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invited us in the Qur'an to reflect over His greatness. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the camel to manifest His greatness. Whereas every animal expresses the greatness of Allah. Simply because the camel was that conveyance to which every Arab could relate. The awal mukhatab of the Qur'an was the Arab. Every animal reflects how great Allah is. But Allah said, أَفَلَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبْلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ Why don't they look at the camel? Because a camel was such a simple example. That is why that villager, that villager said, when he accepted Iman, and people said, how did you recognize Allah? He said, إِنَّ الْبَعْرَ لَيَدُلُّ عَلَى الْبَعِيرِ وَإِنَّ آثَارَ الْأَقْدَامِ لَتَدُلُّ عَلَى الْمَسِيرِ فَالسَّمَاءُ ذَاتِ الْأَبْرَاجِ وَالْأَرْضُ ذَاتِ الْفِجَاجِ وَالْبِحَارُ ذَاتِ الْأَمْوَاجِ أَلَا يَدُلُّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّطِيفِ الْخَبِيرِ He said, إِنَّ الْبَعْرَ لَيَدُلُّ عَلَى الْبَعِيرِ The droppings of a camel tell me a camel has passed. The footsteps of man tell me a human has passed. Oh foolish human, what about the sky above you and the earth beneath you and the rivers around you and the lakes on your sides? Doesn't this also reflect the greatness the magnanimity, the grandeur of someone, and there is Allah. In al Bahra la yadullu ala al Bahir, wa in aathar al Aqdam la tadullu ala al Masir, fa sama udhat al Abraj, wa al Ard udhat al Fijaj, wa al Bihar udhat al Amwaj. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to express his greatness, when Pharaoh was put into, when, because Pharaoh instructed the killing of children, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the mother of Musa that suckle him and nurse him as long as you can, and when you fear that he will be apprehended by the intelligence of Pharaoh, then hand him over to the water. We know the incident. But just one point I want to mention in Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَأَخُذُهُ عَدُوٌّ لِي وَعَدُوٌّ لَكَ وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِّنِّي وَلِتُسْنَعَ عَلَىٰ عَيْنِي If we send an unaccompanied minor, sending a child, you see him traveling, then obviously the cabin crew attend to him, 
Then we obviously, the seniors, the adults on either side, this airport and that airport, they said, don't worry, you send him there. As soon as he gets there, I will be there, my brother is there. I got a friend of mine who's working in the airport, he will receive him on the tarmac. Allah tells the mother of Musa, don't worry, you send Musa in the river Nile. I got my enemy to receive him. The words of the Quran. I've sent my enemy there, he'll come. And he's not only my enemy, he's your child's enemy also, but I sent him to receive him. This is an unaccompanied minor, not in the plane, in water. And Allah said, don't worry, I'm sending my enemy. Subhanallah. وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِّنِّي And what is my strategy of protection? I have put, put such beauty on you, O Musa, that anybody looking at you will just be captured by you. The weapons and the army of Allah, as the Quran says, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُوَ Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what are His armies. So when Allah decided to paralyze the dominion and the empire of Pharaoh, Allah did not send artillery, Allah did not send weapons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the most insignificant creation. فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمُ الطُّوفَانِ وَالْجَرَادِ وَالْقُمَّلْ وَالضَّفَادِ Allah sent frogs. فَفِي الطَّعَامِ ضَفَادِعْ وَفِي الشَّرَابِ ضَفَادِعْ وَفِي الْمَلَابِسِ ضَفَادِعْ Wherever you went, there were frogs. If you see in Qasas Marana Abu al-Hasan Ali Nadwi rahmatullah alayhi has written, وَجُنُودُ اللَّهِ لَا تَعْمَلُ فِيهَا السِّهَامِ Now this is the army of Allah that is frogs, that is frustrating you. It's not something like, you know what, we can get a battalion, arm yourself, okay, there's a frog here. <laughs> Subhanallah. How do you counter the, the army of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Provided the eye is spiritual. Provided the eye is spiritual, we will see the greatness of Allah in everything. The Quran speaks of two visions. One is the physical eye and one is the spiritual eye. The world today... The summary of the effort of the world is to enhance the physical gaze. So there's laser treatment, there is modified types of, uh, different types of eyes that are available nowadays. Blue eyes, grey eyes, green eyes. Subhanallah, according to the dressing, that's the contact lenses. So it's just not matching in your appearance, but matching in your sight also. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the physical eye is not blind. فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارِ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ But if blindness has gripped them, that it is this inner blindness. And remember brother, in this world today, there is so much that is offered through Braille. There is so much that is offered through Braille. We have an exclusive institution in South Africa, a madrasa for the blind. And mashallah, it has excelled and it has performed whereby virtue of braille, the blind can enjoy the very material that the sighted enjoy. But when it comes to the blindness of the heart, then it's not been deprived of material, the consequences of that are much more devastating. The consequences of the blindness of the heart is much more deeper. The Prophet ﷺ constantly alerted the internal gaze of Sahaba. Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu was giving a dars of hadith. Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu says, I came. And as I was coming to the masjid, unintentionally my gaze fell on a strange woman. We would never entertain the thought or the doubt that a Sahabi would deliberately look at a woman. Unintentionally. So he says, as I entered into the masjid, Uthman radiyallahu anhu made the remark and he said, يَدْخُلُ أَحَدُكُمْ وَآثَارُ الزِّنَا بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ Imam Zahabi has made mention of it in his Al-Kabair. Some of you have entered the gathering at this time and I can literally see fornication dripping from their eyes. يَدْخُلُ أَحَدُكُمْ وَآثَارُ الزِّنَا بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ so Anas radiallahu anhu said, I was ashamed and I was shocked. I said, Awahyun ba'da Rasulillah. 
Are people still receiving revelation after the Prophet ﷺ? He said, لا ولكن فراسة صادقة No, no, it's not revelation, but it's the inner eye of a believer. It's the foresight of a believer. It's the vision of a believer and it is by virtue of that I have seen. The Prophet ﷺ passes by the place of the mood centuries afterwards. But the eye is spiritual. So what does he say? He says, لا تدخلوا مساكن الذين ظلموا أنفسهم إلا أن تكونوا باكين Oh my Sahaba, do not pass by the dwellings of those who oppress themselves upon whom came the wrath of Allah but that you lower your gaze, hasten your pace least the torment that came on the nations that preceded you grips you also. Today, unfortunately, it's the absence of the spiritual mind. I let there be a tragedy and three months later it becomes a tourist attraction and then there's photos and there's postcards and it's an event of, of all other forms of entertainment. Qadi Mujahidul Islam, rahimahumullah, a great scholar who visited South Africa as well. Allah fill his grave with nur. When the eye is spiritual, when the eye is divine, then the conclusions are different. Someone told Luqman Hakim, Mimman ta'allamta al-adab. From who did you learn wisdom? He said, I learned it from those who lack it. Mimman ta'allamta al-adab. Where did you learn adab? He said, I learned it from everybody who doesn't have it. This is when the eye is spiritual. So people asked him, how is that possible? He said, every time I seen someone doing something wrong, I said, this is what I must avoid. So I looked at the blunders of others with the eye of learning and I started avoiding the mistakes of others and Allah made me the wise Luqman. So today, unfortunately, we look with the eye of condemning. This Sati got this problem. This brother got that air. This one is doing this. So in the end, I might be justified in what I say, but my Islam is not taking place. I remember Morana Farooq Saab when he came to South Africa, one day he was giving a talk. He said, that brother who goes out in Jola, and while he's out in Jola, he abuses his sight. Allah's qasam, zina will spread through that Jola, hidayat won't spread. That's what his words. The Prophet said the riwayat of Bukhari, If you peep into the house of someone بِغَيْرِ idnin Without permission, and then he comes and he breaks your eye and he defects your vision. لَمْ يَكُنْ عَلَيْكَ جُنَاح Then he's committed no crime. He's justified to do what he has done. Why have you intruded? Why have you invaded his privacy? That is why we are taught we drop our gaze when we go out. And the whole idea is to bring that tertib into our life. It's just not for that time. It's to program our life. So Qadi Mujahidul Islam, Rahmatullahi, one day he was invited to one place to attend a talk. He was a profound scholar. Now, anybody who had seen him, he was an ocean of knowledge, but very simple in his appearance and very, you know, short in his physique. He had no facial hair. Naturally, he had no facial hair. So, when he arrived at the place and they looked at him, the organizers of that particular program, they were a bit disappointed. And they said, is this the man? But he's clean shaven, man. <laughs> the irony of the whole thing is, those that invited him, they were clean shaven themselves. <laughs> they didn't have a beard themselves. But they said, no man. He sensed the frown on their face. He sensed it. And he heard a bit of a shuffle and all that. So he came and said, what's the problem? He said, nay, in kudraya tiraze aapki dari par. You know, they, they take objection to the fact that you don't have a beard. Now again, the eye is spiritual. He said, Subhanallah, Allah knows the truth that my hair doesn't naturally grow, but it brings joy to me to know, look at the eye being spiritual, that although the masses of this ummah have fallen in the sin, it's happy to know and I'm glad to know they don't want to see their leaders in that wrong. I'm happy to know that although they have done this wrong by themselves, but they still expect an image that their leaders don't commit that wrong. This is when the eye is spiritual. From everything you will learn a lesson. 
In English they say, a positive thinker finds an opportunity in every difficulty. And a negative thinker finds a difficulty in every opportunity. A positive thinker, he finds an opportunity, he's, he's optimistic. So he finds an opportunity in every difficulty. And a negative thinker, he finds a difficulty in every opportunity. The Prophet ﷺ was walking with the Sahaba, and there was a carcass, a dead animal lying there, and everybody blocking their nose, and it's got a stench, and it's got a foul smell. The Prophet ﷺ said, this is the time to seize. The hearts are soft. Let me infiltrate. He said, would you like it for a dirham? He seized the opportunity. Sometimes we need to give up what we're doing at home. When the child asks a pertinent question, the heart is receptive. And what we can convey at that time, we cannot convey at other times. But provided we abandon. Nabi Sallallahu sense the time was right, it was perfect. Everybody looking, blocking their nose and... <coughs> Would you like it for a dirham? We won't have it free. I swear by Allah, the world is more despicable to Allah than this animal is to you. The time was right. This world is more despicable. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were the captives of one battle that were brought. And one woman had lost sight of her child. And then she started pacing up and down. She started pacing up and down. And then she caught sight of her child. And then she embraced her child. And when she embraced her child, it was such a sight that moved everyone to tears. It was very emotional. I mean, seeing any mother, nay, seeing an animal embracing its little one is emotional. That's human sentiments that Allah has made us. Just to see a cat taking its little one and sitting down, cuddling it up. And this was a mother, she was, you know, aimlessly just pacing the area. Till she got sight of a child, she grabbed that child, she embraced that child. Sahaba looked at it, moved everybody to tears. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seized the opportunity. أَتَرَوْنَ هَذِهِ الْمَرْأَةُ طَارِحَةً وَلَدَهَا فِي النَّارِ O my Sahaba, I ask you a question. You seen and I seen and we all see. Do you think this woman will ever forsake this child and drop this child in hell? Drop this child and abandon this child? After you seen the love she displayed. They said, never O Nabi of Allah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَاللَّهُ أَرْحَمُ بِعِبَادِهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ بِوَلَدِهَا if you think this woman loved her child, I swear by Allah, Allah loves you more than she loves her child. Lallahu arhamu bi'ibadihi min hadihi biwaladiha. If you think this woman loves her child, Allah loves you much more. So what I was saying is, <clears throat> the greatest joy is when we see the acceptance of our child, we see the hidayat of our child. There's no greater joy. And the more a person is on hidayat, the greater his joy, the greater his honor. You know, I remember once I attended a function where a youngster completed hibs. So then I spoke about the virtue and the crown that will be given to the parents. So after I completed the talk, the sister sent a message to me, says, you know what? Tell the sheikh, my husband's getting no crown and I'm getting two crowns. I said, sister, go easy, man. She says, what I have put in for my child, I'm optimistic Allah is going to give me double crown. I said, may Allah give you double and your husband double. Amongst the personalities that the Quran had spoken about, one is the personality of Isa alayhi salatu was salam. It's important for us to know his life simply because the Quran has spoken about him in about 14 chapters. And also, it explains the encompassing nature of our deen. The wholesome Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَنَا أَقْرَبُ النَّاسِ بِعِيسَ بْنِ مَرْيَمِ If you look at the mutual relation that the Anbiya had amongst themselves, and the respect, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَا تُفَضِّلُونِ عَلَى يُونِسُ بْنُ مَتَّى Allah had given him preference over all the Anbiya. Yet he said, do not constantly say, I am more superior than Yunus. The scholars of hadith explain to us, do not mention my preference over Yunus in a manner that is derogatory to Yunus alayhi salam. One is to say, my son, you're very wonderful, you're excellent. And one is to say, I tell you, all your brothers are hopeless men. So that is being offensive to others. 
the, the importance, I mean it's unfortunate we haven't studied the lives of the Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam. But the respect that the Anbiya had amongst themselves, and the mutual relation they enjoyed is phenomenal. There is a hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi says, I was performing salah. I was performing salah. إِنَّ عِفْرِيتًا مِّنَ الْجِنِّ تَفَلَّتَ عَلَيَّ الْبَارِحَ لِيَقْطَعَ عَلَيَّ الصَّلَاةِ While I was performing salah, one rebel jinn came to interrupt my prayer. فَأَمْكَنَنِي اللَّهُ مِنْهُ Allah gave me access and control over this jinn. فَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَرْبِطَهُ إِلَى سَارِيَةٍ مِّنْ سِوَارِ الْمَسْجِدِ and I had such excess and control, I wanted to tie the jinn to one of the pillars here. And the children would come in Medina and they would have mocked this jinn and they would have laughed at this jinn. فَذَكَرْتُ دَعْوَةَ أَخِي سُلَيْمَانِ But then I thought of the supplication of my late brother Sulaiman. He said, رَبِّ هَبْ لِي مُلْكَ لَا يَنْبَغِي لِأَحَدٍ مِّنْ بَعْدِ Allah give me such an empire that nobody else must have a share in it. And having control over the jinnat was part of the kingdom of my brother Sulaiman. Respecting his dua, I released this jinn. Respecting the supplication of my brother Sulaiman, I respected it. There is a famous hadith that appears in all the books of hadith. That Dawu, that Sayyidina Adam and Sayyidina Musa had an argument in the land of souls. So Musa alayhi salatu was salam told Adam, Adam you the same one that ate from the forbidden tree. Allah told you not to eat, why you ate? This is amongst the prophets, we not saying it. We show utmost respect to the galaxy of Anbiya. This is a Nabi to a Nabi. O oh Adam, Allah told you not to eat, you ate. So Adam alayhi salatu was salam told Musa, how do you know I ate? He said, no, it's in the Torah. He said, you know the Torah is the speech of Allah, it was there before I was created. He said, I know that. He said, why are you blaming me of something that was recorded before I did? <laughs> and the Prophet sallallahu said, in the argument, Adam overpowered Musa. But subhanallah, this is what Adam told Musa. I'm just showing how they had understanding. But when Musa, when Adam made the mistake, he didn't say that to Allah. He said, Rabbana zalamna anfusana. Rabbana zalamna anfusana. Wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna. Lanakoonanna min al khasirin. My Lord, I got no justification. My Lord, I got no explanation. Other than I'm guilty, I admit and I confess. If you forgive me, it's your kindness. If you don't, it's your right. My Lord before you, I got no explanation other than guilt. فَاعْتَرَفْنَا بِذُنُوبِنَا Allah, I confess my wrong. Allah, I admit my wrong. In Ruhul Ma'ani, Allah Ma'alusi Baghdadi has mentioned a narration on the Surah Al-Qadr, where Allah says, لَأَنِينُ الْمُذْنِبِينَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ زَجِلِ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ One is a man sitting there in the corner and he's making subhanallah. Allah says, that impresses me. But another man in the corner is sitting there and just crying and saying, Allah, I have done wrong, forgive me. Allah says, both impress me, but the one re regretting his wrong impresses me more. لَأَنِينُ الْمُذْنِبِينَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ زَجِلِ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ Allah, I have committed a wrong. Allah, I confess my wrong. Allah, I admit my wrong. So the relation of the Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam amongst themselves is unique. As Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we believe and we respect all the Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam. It's very beautiful to see under the commentary of this ayah, وَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى What the Mufassirin have written about the respect. And we also believe, we also believe that just as it is to degrade a Nabi is an insulting to a Nabi, likewise to elevate a Nabi beyond his position is also insulting him. So if you drop him below his rank, that's an insult. 
And if you promote him above his rank, it's also an insult. Just like if a person is an ordinary GP, a general practitioner, and I don't mean to offend the person, it's a good trade and by all means. But then he is an ordinary GP and then you say, this brother, you know what, he is an ophthalmologist, or you know what, he is a pediatrician, or you know what, uh, he is a, a dermatologist, he is a skin specialist. Obviously you insult him the man because he's not that. In the same way, if you promote a Nabi and you give him the position of Allah, which he is not, that is also insulting a Nabi. Islam is a complete, beautiful, wholesome way that teaches us respect to all the Anbiya alayhimu salam. Tilka rusulu faddalna ba'dhuhum ala ba'd la nufarriqu bayna ahadim min rusuli. So amongst the personalities that the Quran has spoken about, one is the life of Isa alayhi salatu was salam. Allah speaks about the mother, the virgin Mary. Allah speaks about the son Isa alayhi salatu was salam. It is mentioned in Sirat al-Anbiya that the mother of Maryam, that is Sayyidatina Hannah and her father Imran, initially after marriage there was no child. There was no child. And one day she seen a bird embracing the nestling, which moved her to tears. And she said, I hope and pray that Allah also gives me a child. And if Allah gives me a child, then I can also share the sentiments of a mother would like any woman would. It wasn't long that Allah accepted her, her dua. And she conceived. And when she conceived as a token of gratitude to Allah, she said, I'm going to devote my child exclusively to the cause of Allah. I'm going to devote my child exclusively to the cause of Allah. Now, easier said than done. Many of us in haste make the commitments. But when reality kicks in, it's a different story. Muhammad ibn Munkadir rahimahumullah was a great tabi'i. He one day came to Aisha radiallahu anha and he asked for some money. Aisha radiallahu anha said, I have nothing but you're such a great man. If I had 10,000 dirhams, I would have given it to you. It, 10 minutes later, someone knocked the door. And he came to Aisha and he gave her a gift of 10,000 dirhams. Aisha radiallahu anha said, it looks like my Lord has put my words to test. You tell your wife, I promise you if I had, I would have bought you whatever you want. And then you go there and you get your bonus check. <laughs> my wife mustn't know, boss. Otherwise... The actual check and the bonus check, both will go. <laughs> you know that youngster asks his dad, Dad, how much does it cost to get married? He said, I don't know, I'm still paying. <laughs> I can't give you a figure, my friend, I'm still paying. When nikah will become simple, Allah's qasam, zina will become difficult. When nikah will become difficult, zina will become simple. Today we've made nikah difficult, zina has become simple. Make your nikah simple, zina will become difficult. How easy zina has become? On the phone, on the net, on the books, at every club, at every pub, at every corner. Why? Because the formalities of nikah have become difficult. So what the youngsters say, why must you take contract, pay as you go? Make nikah simple, zina will become difficult. The hadith of Bukhari, a woman came and presented herself. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, this was his exclusive privilege. Allah speaks about it in Surah Ahzab. وَامْرَأَةً مُؤْمِنَةً إِنْ وَهَبَتْ نَفْسَهَا لِلنَّبِيِّ إِنْ أَرَادَ النَّبِيُّ أَنْ يَسْتَنْكِحَهَا خَالِصَةً لَكَ مِنْ دُونِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ and if a woman comes to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a believing female, in wahabat nafsaha, if she presents herself to you, in wahabat nafsaha lin nabiyyi, in arada an nabiyyu, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chooses to get married to her, then this is your right, without any dowry you can accept her. Khalisatan laka min dun al mu'mineen. This is exclusive to you and for no one else. Unfortunately, we only look at this year, we say, it was nice for the Prophet ﷺ. My brother, that is one thing, but look at everything else. So may we fall. The Prophet ﷺ used to fast for 72 hours consecutively. Sahaba endeavored to fast, and they said, إِنَّكَ تُوَاصِلْ 
the Prophet ﷺ said, don't try, you won't make it. They endeavored the first day. In other words, it was uninterrupted. There's no iftar, there's no suhoor. One go, 72 hours. Sahaba tried, but by 24 hours, obviously, they could not sustain it. He said, none of you are like me. For me, worship in Allah is nutrition to my body. For me, worship in Allah is nutrition. This woman comes and presents herself to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ very modestly gazes. If you read the Shamayl Tirmidhi of the Prophet ﷺ, he had a light eye. In his entire blessed life, he never stared at anything, never mind haram. He never gave a staring look. Because sometimes if you give a, 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 a fixed look at someone, your intention might be to identify him, but obviously you leave him nervous. Now, what is this guy looking at me like, you know? <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ had a light eye, he had a passing eye, and never had an offensive eye. So he very modestly gazed at this woman, and from his gesture he declined. He was very modest. كَانَ أَشَدَّ حَيَاءً مِنَ الْعَذْرَى إِذَا كَرِهَ شَيْئًا عَرَفْنَاهُ فِي وَجْهِ He was more modest than a virgin girl of that time. Sahaba say when he dislikes something, when he dislikes something, we realized it from his face. But he never, he never used to verbalize it. He never used to, ex, you know, emphatically express it. His modesty was such. It was very, very modest. I'll mention one incident now in the Quran. Allah speaks of his modesty. So this Sahabi said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, it looks like you're not interested. If you're not, I'm ready. Subhanallah. It was clean, it was clear. That's what I said. Make nikah simple, zina will become difficult. Because nikah is so easy, so simple. The Prophet ﷺ said, Do you have anything to give in dowry? He said, No, I have nothing. The Prophet ﷺ said, Walau khataman min hadith. Go look, maybe you'll find a ring lying in your house somewhere. He said, I don't even have a ring, O Prophet. I don't have a dime. I own nothing. What I do have is the trouser on the way of Allah. The hadith of Bukhari. And we said, now, I mean, what's the trouser? If you give it to her, what will you wear? He said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, but I want to get married. The Prophet ﷺ got this man married without anything. So that no ummati ever till the day of Qiyamah can delay his nikah on the ground of the lack of funds. Nobody can come and say that. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا خَطَبَ إِلَيْكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ That if a proposal comes and you're happy with the piety and the character, then get your daughter married. إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوا If you don't do it, تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ عَرِيذٌ It will lead to widespread corruption across the globe. Now, the neglecting and denying and declining from a good proposal, if it's going to cause corruption across the globe, you tell me the epicenter of that quake, that is the house, the heart where that fitna will start is the house, what won't it cause there? And when you have an earthquake, they talk of the epicenter, where the biggest part it took place. So the place from where it stems, where it originates, where it's founded, what will happen there? The Prophet ﷺ said, how many chapters of the Qur'an have you memorized? He said, I know this chapter and this chapter. Have you committed it to memory? He says, yes, I know it by memory. He said, اذهب فقد ملكتكها بما معك من القرآن. Okay, you go and your dowry exclusive to you for your wife is you teach her all these surahs of the Qur'an. That's your dowry. And he got them married. What did Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said? أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ فِي مَا أَمَرَكُمْ مِنَ النِّكَاحِ يُنْجِزْ لَكُمْ مَا وَعَدَكُمْ مِنَ الْغِنَى Allah said, وَأَنْكِحُوا الْأَيَامَا مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ Ayama is the plural of the word ayyim. And this is the comprehensive nature of the Arabic language. Ayyim alladhi la zawja lahu. Ayyim means a single person. Whether married or not. Spinster or bachelor. Divorcee or widow. Or widower. Anyone who is single, Allah says, get them married. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, لَوْ لَمْ يَبْقَ مِنْ أَجْلِي إِلَّا ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامِ وَلِي طَوْلٌ عَلَى النِّكَاحِ لَتَزَوَّجْتُهُ 
Allah Azza wa Jalla Azaba. If I know I'm going to die in three days and I'm not married, in this three days also I'll hasten and get married because I don't want to meet my Allah unmarried. We have the answer to the problems of this world to bring haya. Hazrat Ji Mawlana Inamul Hasan Rahmatullah Ali, Nawar Allahu Marqadahu. He mentioned and I said it today. He said the summary of our deen is two things. Simplicity and modesty. Simplicity and modesty. I once had the good privilege to be in Raiwin Markaz. It was the time when Mawlana Saeed Ahmad Khan Sab Muhajir Madani Rahmatullah Ali was present there. There was a jamaat of ulama for one year and I was out for a short span of time. We were together there. It was the month of Ramadan, 98. And after Asr was uh, Sayyid Khan Sahib Rahmatullah Ali's program. Every day after Asr. Subhanallah, diligently I made it a point that I went and sat right in front. And every day he spoke on the same hadith. Every day he spoke on the hadith. What is it? Where the Prophet ﷺ said, that the greatest fitna that I leave behind for the men of my ummah is the fitna of woman. And after that he said, my tashkil is not four months or forty days. My tashkil is who will save himself from the fitna of woman. Raise your hands. Wallah, this was in Raywin Merkaz and I was sitting there. If I, the next day I hasten, the same hadith, the same tashkil. The third day I hasten, the same hadith, the same tashkil. What was the dawah of Sahaba that instantly lives turned? Every one of them did so much, yet they never considered. That is why Hassan Rahmatullah Ali, Hassan Radiallahu Anhu, the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I read a beautiful quotation. He said, "Innama haqiqatul amal, tarku mulahadat al amal, la tarku al amal." He said, "The reality of piety is." You stop considering your actions and not you stop performing actions. The reality of piety is you perform it but you don't consider it. So you give your life but you don't think I have done anything. Dawud alayhi salam told Allah, Ya Rabbi kayfa ashkuruka wa shukri laka ni'ma. Qal al-an shakartani ya Dawud. Allah, how I am going to be grateful to you when my being grateful is a bounty of yours. So I'm obligated to you in being obligated. Allah said, Dawood, after you've exhausted everything and you've acknowledged you have failed, now you are grateful. Al-an shakartani. That you said you've done everything and you give up. Unfortunately, this has to come out of our mind that I have done so much. And I'm doing this qurbani. This deen is the deen of Allah. It's my job. Anybody who helps him, Allah reward him. Not my brother, where were you and why you came now? Allah forbid, if you have a breakdown on the road and your car is stationed and you're waiting there for three hours and somebody comes after three hours, you're not going to tell him, where were you for the last three hours? Jazakallah brother for coming. Subhanallah. I appreciate it. In the very same way, every man has to treat deen as his responsibility. And whoever comes, Allah reward him for coming. Mawlana Shaf Ali Tanwi Rahmatullah Ali used to say, Allah's qasam, I consider every Muslim in the world better than me. And I consider every non-Muslim potentially better than me. Because Allah can give him iman and deprive me of iman. Every Muslim in the world is better. And every non-Muslim is potentially better than me. When Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab was in the throes of death, he said, Wallahi, law anna li ma tala'at alayhi shams, laftadaytu bihi min hawli al-matla'. If I owned whatever is in this earth, I would have saved myself and given it in ransom. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was present. He said, In kana islamuka la nasra, wa in kanat imaratuka la fatha, wa laqad mala'at al-arda adla. O oh, Umar, O oh, Umar, your Islam was a triumph. Your rulership was a victory and you brought justice to this land. Umar ibn Khattab said, Atashhadu li bihada inda Allahi yawm al-qiyamah. Oh ibn Abbas, you said it to me. Are you ready to repeat the words before Allah on the day of Qiyamah? 
He said, I'm ready to repeat it before Allah on the day of Qiyamah. فَفَرِحَ بِذَلِكَ Umar. Umar said, now I can say, Ibn Abbas, if you can stand up for me on the day of Qiyamah, the world calls you brilliant, they call you intelligent, they call you phenomenal. Today they call you this, tomorrow they degrade you. But if Allah has praised you, what did the Quran say? وَوَهَبْنَا لِدَاوُودَ سُلَيْمَانِ نِعْمَ الْعَبْدِ The word ni'ma in Arabic comes to convey excellence. If you can get the credibility and you can get the confirmation of ni'ma al-abd from Allah, my brother, you made it. But if the world calls you ni'ma al-abd and Allah calls you bi'as al-abd, then I'm afraid you're doomed. One brother was walking. Someone insulted him. He said, my brother, between me and Jannah, there is a bridge. If I cross it, I don't bother what you say because Allah has considered me successful. But if I fail to cross it, I'm worse than what you said. Someone insulted Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. This is mentioned in Hayat al-Sahaba. He said, if I am like that, may Allah forgive me. And if I'm not like that, may Allah forgive you. How simple they resolve the most complex they didn't become ugly. They didn't become inflammatory. If I am like that, may Allah forgive me. And if I'm not like that, may Allah forgive you. Allahu Akbar. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was walking. Someone insulted him. And then Abu Bakr kept quiet. And then he insulted again. And then Abu Bakr retorted. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Siddiq wa la'an kalla wa rabbil ka'ba. Siddiq wa la'an kalla wa rabbil ka'ba. One side you are Abu Bakr Siddiq and one side you curse. These two don't gel. They don't tie. I can't marry the two together. How can you put these two things together? You are Abu Bakr Siddiq and you curse. I can't tie it up. One side my brother, Allah forgive me and you. You are dressed in the sunnah garb. You are reflecting the image of Muhammad wasallam with a flowing beard. And at the same time, you have a cigarette in your hand. It just doesn't tie with the profile of a believer. I just can't link this two together. Kalla wa rabbil ka'ba. One side you're a believer or a young man, and at the same time you frequent in the clubs. Kalla wa rabbil ka'ba. You can't tie this. You can't marry it. So this has to come out of my mind that I am doing and I am achieving. That is why Mawlana Shufali Tanwi Rahmatullahi said, it's not wrong to say I'm more learned than you. But it's wrong to say I'm better than you. It's not wrong to say I gave more chillas. If I gave four and you gave one, if I say no, I haven't given more, then I'm a liar because I did go more. I'm not saying I went, Allah accept us all. One brother spent four months, and one brother's been out for ten days. It's correct for him to say, I've been out more, because you have been out more. But to say, I'm better, that's wrong, because maybe Allah accepted his ten days and rejected your four months. So I can say, I've spent more time, but I cannot claim I'm better, because I don't know what Allah has accepted. Your ten days could be accepted. So there is a hadith in Bukhari where the Prophet, a person came to the Prophet, وسلم, he said, O Prophet of Allah, must I read the kalima and then join you? Or must I join you and then read the kalima afterwards? He said, no, read the kalima and join us. So he read the kalima and then he, and this was the company of a Nabi that instantly, instantly there's such a revolution in his life that he utters the kalima and the level of iman rises so high that he's ready to make the most supreme sacrifice to present his life. So he reads the kalima, he embraces the faith, he joins the campaign and he loses his life. The Prophet said, Amila Khalil wa ujira kateer. Amila Khalil wa ujira kateer. He got away easy. He did a little and he took a lot. The hadith of Bukhari, he had not performed one salah and he had not observed one fast, but Allah accepted it on time. I was in the UK in the month of Ramadan, and in Ramadan while I was there, there was a brother who had reverted to Islam a week before Ramadan, and in Ramadan he passed away. Subhanallah, amila qaleel wa ujra kathir. Before Ramadan Allah gave him iman, and in Ramadan Allah took his ruh. 
So I can say I gave more time, but I cannot say I'm better because I don't know what Allah accepts. Junaid Baghdadi passed away. What a great scholar. Allah asked him, you know, in, in people seen him in a dream and asked him, Junaid, how did you fare before Allah? He said, Halakatil ibarat wa faniyatil isharat wa ma nafa'ana illa ruka'at fi jawfil layl. All the books I recorded, Allah cancelled it. All the hajj I performed, Allah rejected it. You know, brother, you go submit your documents for an application of a visa. You have furnished the documents aptly, precisely, promptly, diligently. But the ambassador reserves the authority to decline without explanation. And you forfeit your fees, by the way. Your fees are gone. That's just standard procedures. Kindly take note. The management is not held liable in the event. When they reserve the rights of declining, and rightfully so, has Allah not got the prerogative and the authority of rejecting when there is every reason for your actions to be rejected? He said, I appeared before Allah, Allah accepted nothing, but Allah said, Junaid, because of that tahajjud, I'm going to forgive you, go. Because of that tahajjud, other than that, nothing else, but anyway, that is allowing me, I'm going to forgive you because of that. So, the reality of amal is tarku mulahadatil amal la tarku al-amal. That I got to keep on doing amal. Wa'abud rabbaka hatta ya'tiyaka al-yaqeen. Worship your Lord until death overpowers you. Constantly in dawah. Constantly in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I do it constantly without me considering, then gradually that condition will come. Rabi ibn Khutaym, a young boy, during the era of Sahaba, is to spend his night in ibadat. His mother awakens by night, فَتَجِدُ ibnaha al-yafi' مَا زَالَ صَافًا فِي مِحْرَابِهِ سَابِحًا فِي مُنَاجَاتِهِ مُسْتَغْرِقًا فِي صَلَاتِهِ What a sight. She gets up in the dead of night and she finds her young son is busy crying and making dua to Allah. May Allah make that a common sight in our homes. What a pleasant sight. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said, لَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَقَرَّ لِعَيْنِ الْمُؤْمِنِ مِنْ أَنْ يَرَى زَوْجَتَهُ وَأَوْلَادَهُ مُتِعِينَ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said, there's nothing that can capture the eye of a believer and comfort the heart of a believer more than finding your wife and your children obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallah, that is paradise in this world. To walk in and just hear the sound of your children reading Quran, to find your wife in sajda, instead of find one on this net and one on that net, and one busy watching here, one busy seeing there. Subhanallah, what a, what a sad, what a tragic, what a devoid home. So the mom wakes up by night, she finds the son in ibadah. She says, Ya Bunayya, Allah tanam. Go sleep, my son. So he says, كَيْفَ يَنَامُ مَنْ جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلِ وَهُوَ يَخْشَى الْبَيَاتِ Oh, my mom, if I've got a liability and there's a burden on my shoulders, how can I go sleep? So the mom says, my son, what have you done? لَعَلَّكَ أَتَيْتَ جُرْمًا لَعَلَّكَ قَتَلْتَ نَفْسًا Have you killed someone? Have you done something wrong? Are you owing money? He says, yes, oh, my mom, قَتَلْتُ نَفْسًا I have killed someone. So the mother says, "Wallahi, law alima ahlu al-qatili, ma tuani min al-buka wa ma tukabidu min al-sahari la rahimuka." If the heirs of the deceased have to know how you cry, I promise you they will forgive you unconditionally. Who are they, O oh my son, so that I can speak to them? He says, "Ya umma, la tukallimi ahdan, fa inna ma qataltu nafsi wa qataltuha bidhunubi." Oh my mother, who are you going to talk to? I haven't killed one, I've killed many. And I've killed myself repeatedly. And I've killed myself by disobeying my Allah. That is my crime. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to look at this young boy and say, Ya Aba Yazid, Law ra'aka Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la ahabbak. He wasn't a sahabi, he was a tabi'i. Abdullah ibn Masood used to say, Oh Abu Yazid, Oh Rabi oh, oh, Rabi ibn Khutaym, if Muhammad had to see you, I promise you he would have loved you. He would have fallen in love with you. 
Imagine the testimony of Abdullah ibn Masood in your favor that Allah's Nabi will love you. What a testimony! In Hayat al Sahaba, there is a narration someone came to Huzayfa ibn Yaman and said, Did you see the Prophet of Allah? He said, Of course we've seen him. He said, What did you do? He said, We tried to follow him the best we could. So this man made a claim. He was not a Sahabi. He said, If we had to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa we would have carried him on our shoulders and on our necks and we wouldn't have allowed him to walk. Abdullah Huzayfa radiallahu anhu said, Oh my brother, just, just stop it there and there. It's easier said than done. If you had to be with us in the battle of Khandak and trenches, I promise you to preserve your iman had become difficult. It had become difficult. When it was extremely cold and everybody was clinging to the earth and the Prophet said, May ya'tini bi khabrihim ja'alahu Allahu rafiqi yawm al qiyamah. Who will intercept the information and Allah will make him my friend in Jannat. When the armies collectively for no provocation from the Muslims, they came to kill the Muslims. And the Muslims did nothing but defended themselves. And the Prophet said, who will relate to me? And nobody stood up. And he said, whoever will relate, Allah will make him my friend. And you said you would have carried him on your shoulder? Ask me what we paid my friend. And the third time he said it, no one. And then he said, Ya Huzayfatu. And Huzayfa said, when he took my name, I had no choice. And I stood up. And I came there. And it was bitter cold. And then he made dua for me. As soon as he made dua for me and I started walking, I felt like I was walking in a hot shower. And that's the riwayat of Bidaya wa Niyaya. And when I returned, my companions were still feeling extremely cold. And I was feeling absolutely calm. And then he said, the Prophet ﷺ put me on his lap. And I spent the latter part of my night in the lap of Muhammad ﷺ. Zayd ibn Sakan radiallahu anhu, when he passed away, فَمَاتَ وَخَدَّهُ عَلَى حِجْرِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He passed away while his cheek was on the lap of Muhammad ﷺ. Some are dying in the laps of clinics. Some are dying in the laps of nurses. Some are dying in the laps of doctors. Zayd ibn Sakan dies while his eyes are looking at the eyes of my Nabi and his head is on the lap of my Nabi. Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abd Rabbihi, whose name comes in the books of Hadith under the chapter of Azan, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he said, Oh my Lord, this vision was good to see your Nabi, he's gone. What am I going to do with this eyes? Seize my sight. Allah took his vision away there and there. Fakuffa basaru. Allah, at least I could see your Nabi. Let that be the last sight. So this atmosphere to become alive in our homes, this is this Mubarak effort. This is why there is this halqaz of ta'aleem. That our home becomes an activity, a hub of piety. We are learning and teaching, where piety and understanding, where loyalty and faithfulness happens. Where the amal of Masjid and Nabawi becomes alive. Unfortunately today, what is our condition if somebody comes home, where's brother so and so, he's gone to work. What time will he be back? Oh, there's no fixed time. Okay, no problem. The next day you go, where's brother Yusuf, he's in the masjid. Alright, I'll come back. He said, no, 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 he'll be back now, now. He'll be back now, now. So even at home they know, when I go to the masjid, I'm back now, now. When I go to the shop, there's no fixed time. I know it, my family knows it in the masjid. It's minimum time. Why? Because I have no connection. I have no attachment. The average, today the average person, just look at the depression, the psychological depression that grips the mind of an average person today. Besides becoming a victim to a crisis, just the fear that haunts an average mind, that is depression itself. I mustn't become sick is enough depression. One is you got cancer, you got depression. One is I am fearing I mustn't get cancer, that has depressed me. And really this is it. I mustn't meet up in an accident. I mustn't this year. Mustn't, I need coverage. I need this. I need. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet ﷺ the answer. وَلَقَدْ نَعَلَّمُ أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدَرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ We know their blatant accusations creates depression in your heart. It hurts you. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ you fall in sajda and that's the solution to all your depression. In the hadith it comes, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah is the cure for 99 ailments 
the least of which is depression. The least. Constantly today you see what were depression clinics, this clinic, that clinic. Like I say, today it has become an easy world. Any problem you got, you just add the word syndrome next to it and it's a medical condition. <laughs> Any word you just put a syndrome, the word syndrome. It's got, we know medical has got a Down syndrome. One youngster came to me and said, Sheikh, I suffer middle child syndrome. <laughs> middle child syndrome. So I said, subhanallah, you know, now this is it. You know, when the first child is born, then you're very confused and you're worried. You know, the, the first child does something, immediately you rush him to the doctor. But by the time it's the fifth one, the fifth youngster, he came to his dad. He says, dad, you know what, I swallowed a coin. He said, I'll deduct that from your spending. <laughs> When it's the first one, you rush him to the doctor. By the third one, you're immune. <laughs> yeah, children, eh? Chalakere, man. What are you going to watch, eh? <laughs> So I swallowed. He said, right, so much spending less. The solution to your depression is salah. Imam Tirmizi quotes the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ came late for fajr. And sahaba patiently wait. What, what a congregation. Patiently waiting. Yeah, let the imam come one second. <laughs> Subhanallah. فَإِذَا دَخَلَ الْمَسْجِدْ كَانَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ مَا كَانَ الصَّلَاةُ تَحْبِسُهُ My Nabi said your extra second is also in salah. You cannot perform extra salah. Allah is giving it to you. Just take it nicely. فَإِذَا دَخَلَ الْمَسْجِدْ كَانَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ مَا كَانَتِ الصَّلَاةُ تَحْبِسُهُ Sahaba, they waited. The Prophet ﷺ came. Salah was performed. He said, عَلَى مَصَفِّكُمْ هَذَا Don't move. إِنِّي قُمْتُ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ I stood up by night. And Imam Tirmizi says, سَأَلْتُ مُحَمَّدَ بْنِ إِسْمَعِيلِ I spoke to Imam Bukhari on the authenticity of this hadith. And he told me it is sahih. So when I stood up by night, فَنَعَسْتُ فِي صَلَاتِي In my salah, I went into a trance. And while I was in salah, فَإِذَا أَنَا بِرَبِّي تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى فِي أَحْسَنِ سُورَةِ In my salah, I seen my Allah in the most beautiful appearance. My Allah said, Ya Muhammad, صلى الله عليه وسلم, I said, لَبَّيْكْ Allah said, فِيمَ يَخْتَسِمُ الْمَلَأُ الْأَعْلَى What are the angels above you discussing? I said, oh Allah, I don't know. I don't know. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed his hand on my chest. Now we know we do not visualize a hand for Allah. We do not imagine an organ for Allah. But we say, as it befits the majesty of Allah. وَلَهُ يَدَانِ كَمَا يَقُولُ إِلَاهُنَا وَيَمِينُهُ جَلَّتْ عَنِ الْأَيْمَانِ كِلْتَا يَدَيْ رَبِّي يَمِينٌ وَصْفُهَا The poet says, my Allah has a hand as he has said in the manner that it befits him and both the hands of my Allah are right, there's no left hand. وَلَهُ يَدَانِ كَمَا يَقُولُ إِلَاهُنَا So we do not, we do not make an image, we do not make a visual, we do not imagine an organ for Allah. As it befits the majesty of Allah, it is mutashabiyat, he knows best. The Prophet ﷺ says, حَتَّى وَجَدْتُ بَرْدَ أَنَامِلِهِ بَيْنَ تَدْيَيَّ I felt the coolness of that in my entire body. I felt the coolness of that in my entire body. And then because of that, فَتَجَلَّى لِي كُلُّ شَيْءٍ Now I could see into the heavens and everything was vivid. And then Allah asked me, what are the angels discussing? And I said, oh Allah, they're discussing the reward of those that come to the masjid. And they're discussing the reward of wudu. And they're discussing the reward of good actions. And then Allah said, ask me, O oh Muhammad, and I will grant it to you. Now imagine if you are given a meeting with a top minister. Or you are given a meeting with a, with a great officer. At that time, in that 15 minutes, you will try and maximize all the benefits for you and your family. If you can organize citizenship, you can get a job for someone, you can get housing for a third person, you, whatever you can do. This is the time with that closeness, with that closeness. In fact, in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was performing salah, and in salah he advanced. Sahaba said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, in salah we notice you, observe, you advance. 
He said, in my salah I walked into the gardens of Jannah. And I seen a branch of grapes. And if I had to pluck that branch off and given it to you, لَأَكَلْتُمْ مَا بَقِيَّةِ dunya, You would have eaten from that grapes till the day of Qiyamah. That was the closeness. And then Allah asked me, O oh Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ask whatever you want to ask. And I said, Allahumma inni as'aluka fi'al al-khayrat, wa tarka al-munkarat, wa hubb al-masakeen, wa an taghfira li wa tarhamani, wa idha aradta bi qawmin fitna, fatawaffani ghayra maftoon. Allah, I ask you the constant ability to obey you. Allah, that's what I ask. Allahumma inni as'aluka fi'al al-khayrat. Allah, that's, that's my request. So he used to make the dua, Ya Muqallib al-Qulub, Thabbit Qulubana, Oh, the turner of hearts, keep my heart focused towards you. Sahaba said, Atakhafu alayna ya Rasulullah, oh, Prophet of Allah, why are you asking so much? We will not abandon you. We will not forsake you. We with you. He said, it's not as easy as you have said. Inna al-Qulub, bayna isba'ayni min asabi'i rahman yuqallibuha kayfa yasha. Allah can flip and turn the hearts of any person in any direction at any time. Allah, I ask you the constant ability to obey you. وَتَرْكَ munkarat, And let sin come out of my life. Sin, my brothers, is like poison. Every quantity of it is harmful. Sin is like poison. There's no quantity of poison that's negligible. Everything poses a threat. That is sin. Nothing of it is negligible that can be overlooked. Everything poses a serious threat. It's enough to cripple you. It's enough to destroy you. Until and unless we don't eradicate sin from our life, we will not see the sweetness of ibadat. I'm going to conclude on one note. During the reign of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, Saeed ibn Amir was made the governor of Hims those days there was total transparency. Nobody was above the law. Everyone was subjected and he had to answer and they had to, you know, there was total transparency. The people of Hims were very famous for complaining about their governors. This was known about them. So anyway, Umar radiallahu anhu one day went to Hims and he asked them, كَيْفَ وَجَدْتُمْ عَامِلَكُمْ How did you find their gov- your governor? So they said, Nashku arba'am min af'alihi. He's a good man, but we have four problems with him. You know, woman, husband is a nice man, I don't say no, but... You know, one of my scholars used to say, he said, the only time a woman will praise her husband is two times. One is before she's married to him. He's a great guy. Oh, you haven't heard about, oh wow, man, he's a great man. And the second is when his body leaves home and the janaza goes. Your people's father was a good man, man. Tell him on his face. Giving flowers to the grave, give flowers to the man when he's loving. Praising him before you married and after his janazah leaves. Unfortunately, we've become a nation. It takes the death of people fast to appreciate. Till we don't lose, we don't open our eyes. Till then we don't acknowledge. We overlook. In my humble years of marital counseling, if I can summarize the two key most problems that have negatively implicated and negatively affected our marriages. One is disloyalty from men and ungratefulness from women. If men can become loyal and women can become grateful, I promise you 80% of our marriages are saved. But men are disloyal and women unfortunately are ungrateful. So a woman will typically point to her husband... All his bangles are shaking and all his rings are open. You did nothing for me. <laughs> all these are his rings, his bangles. 
You did nothing. You're looking at your own clothing, you're looking at your own jewelry. And the Prophet said, لو أحسنت إلى إحداهن الدهر ثم رأت فيك شيئا Appreciate the Arabic grammar. Dahar means a decade. Decade means ten years. The Prophet says, if you are loyal to her for ten years, ثم رأت فيك شيئا And then in your human nature, one day, one day, by mistake, unintentionally, unwittingly, you fail to phone her or do that. مَا رَأَيْتُ فِيكَ خَيْرًا قَدُّهُ she will say, I have never ever seen any good. I had a lot of proposals. I don't know why I came here. <laughs> On the other hand, disloyalty from men. The Prophet was, what a unique man. I read this riwayat myself and I cried. Wallah, I cried. I said, Ya Allah, what a nabi. Aisha radiallahu anha said he used to come home. He wants to spend the night in salah. But he would respect me so much that he wouldn't go straight to salah. He would jump into the bed, speak to me, speak to me, speak to me. And he would never deny me our social talk. Because generally the night time is the time where husband and wife can discuss the events of the day. The day is long, it's tiring, the children work, the domestic chores. It's, it's a long, tiring day, that's how life is. And when you retire to bed and you drop, that's the time you socialize and you, you know, revive the incidents of the day. And unfortunately today we've lost that also. So typically it's two individuals sharing the same roof with a different agenda. That's how life has become. It's no more a, a, a unit. It's no more a family circle. It's few people living under the same roof but independent. So you'll find times where people will be living under one roof but they never meet. When he walks in, they sleep in. And when he gets up, they go on to work. Aisha radiallahu anha says he would jump into the bed. He would sit with me. He would socialize with me. He would speak to me. When he would perceive that I had fallen off to sleep, then calmly he would excuse himself from the bed and then spend the night in ibadah. Imagine the Prophet of Allah wants to devote his night to ibadah, but he doesn't deny our mother her time. Today, unfortunately, we got filled to see on the internet and we deny our woman that socializing moments. And for the sake of salah, he doesn't deny it to his wife. That is not piety that when you meet with your wife, you're making subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. Make a subhanallah in the shop when other women are walking. I don't mean look at them and say subhanallah. <laughs> at that time it's piety. Socialize. He said, what a man he was. Allama ibn Jawzi rahmatullah has made mention of a narration in Alamun Nisa. That the Prophet was going in Hajjatul Wada and Aisha and Safiya radiallahu anha were with. And Aisha radiallahu anha's camel was swift and her luggage was light. And Safiya's camel was, was, um, Aisha, uh, Safiya's camel was, was sluggish and her, her bedding was heavy. Now the Prophet you know, took each one in their own stride. A brother has come first time in the path of Allah. He's come with a heavy You're going for six months? <laughs> no, my brother. Understand where is he coming from? Understand where is he coming from. He's, he, he's not sacrificing a bed. He's sacrificing the lap of a virgin girl. He's sacrificing a club. He's sacrificing a social circle of drugs. He's not coming from a hot bed. He's coming from the heart of sin. Welcome him. Embrace him. Respect him. Make his khidmat. Win him over. Appreciate where is he coming from. And again I appeal to the, those in charge of the masjid. You got a jamaat of youngsters coming here in the house of Allah. We know it is the house of Allah. And I have to respect it and you have to respect it and they have to respect it. But rather let us be patient and tolerant with the little noise they make here. Wallah, they better off making noise here than making zina outside here. I ask you, whoever is in charge of the masjid, make sabr, this is our youth. I'm not justifying the wrong in the masjid for a moment. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Hawwilu mata'a Aisha ala jamali Safiya wa mata'a Safiya ala jamali Aisha. Listen, we got a problem. He didn't condemn Safiya. Safiya, look at you. This is how you must travel like Aisha, only hand luggage. You are Saf... No, no. I be hurry No, no. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never spoke like that. Our tongues are too loose. 
we just blurt. And we just, it's flames we throw out. Nabi Sassam didn't say, he said, okay, let's do this here. Obviously her camel is sluggish and her bedding is heavy. Let's take her bedding, bedding and just put it on Aisha's camel. And Aisha's camel is, is swift and her bedding is light. We'll put it on Sophia. Now obviously, for, for a co-wife to another wife, you put in your stuff on my camel like hey, it's not on. <laughs> so Aisha Radiallahu said, once again the Safiya caused it. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that her camel was sluggish and her bedding was heavy. All we did was we took her bedding and we put it on your, on your camel. And we put your bed in there. She won't steal it. So Aisha radiallahu anha looks at Nabi Sassam. Alasta Nabi Allahi haqqa. But then you say you're a prophet. You say you're Muhammad and you get wahi in handu. Tabi to wota Nabi cho. So Nabi Sassam said, Awa fi shakkin anti. Yeah, I am a Nabi. Do you have doubt about it? So then she says, Fahalla adalta. If you're a prophet, then where's your fairness? Where's your justice? This is my camel. And just then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu comes and he's about to slap her. And Nabi Sassam holds him. And he says, Abu Bakr, move away. Look at the composure of the Prophet sallallahu This akhlaat the world is desperate for. You say those that got the coke recipe, they're not giving it to anyone. You got the life of Muhammad and you're mizing with it. You got the solution to the problems of the world and you're hoarding it. Leave others with their recipe and their formula. Fahallah adult, where's your justice? And then he advances and Nabi Sassam held him. So he says, but oh Nabi of Allah, look at how she's talking. Nabi Sassam said, Abu Bakr, you know when a woman is emotional, she can't see top from bottom, right from left. She's emotional, just, just, just leave her. Just leave her. Just let her say her thing and move on. We're not going to make this an issue. We've got other things in life to carry on with. Ah, what composure, what composure. The Prophet ﷺ was in the throes of death. And then all the wives around him. And Safiya radiallahu anha said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I wish I was in your pain and you were in my comfort. Now obviously that was a sincere statement, but it won't go down well with the other wives. Like, what are you trying to say? Are you trying? So it comes in the narration, they started winking eyes like, Awe ane humba. How is this? Nabi Sassam said, go on winking your eyes, I swear by Allah, I know my Safiya means what she says. Go on winking your eyes, I know my Safiya means what she says. This is the character. So I was saying that if loyalty can come into men, and gratefulness can come into women, Allah, 80% of our marriages are saved. Then you will see the true beauty that Allah has put in your partner. So I want to end up with that incident of Saeed ibn Amir. They said we have four complaints of our governor. Number one, لا يخرج إلينا حتى يتعالى النهار. He only comes out to answer our problems after the sun has risen and it's afternoon. So in the morning you can't meet him. لا يجيب أحدا بليل. In the night you can go knock the door, he'll never answer. وله يوم في الشهر لا يخرج إلينا. And one day in the month he doesn't come out at all. And he'll be sitting in a gathering with us, we're talking, and then after that he gets a fit, and he gets an attack of epilepsy, and he collapses, and then he just passes out, and then we need to revive him, and then, you know, he loses his balance, and we just can't speak to him. So these are the four grievances we have. Umar radiallahu anhu performed salah, and he made dua. He said, Allahumma la tukhayyib raja'i fihi al Oh Allah, I put Saeed ibn Amir as the governor, I had great hopes in him. Let not my hopes be shattered. Let me not be disappointed. He called the people. He called Saeed ibn Amir. He said, what's your first complaint? He said, لا يخرج إلينا حتى يتعالى النهار. He comes out only at midday. Saeed ibn Amir was brought in the box. Speak up my brother. This is the complaint leveled against you. He said, I wouldn't want to say this, but because I'm put in the position where I am, the reality of the matter is there's no domestic servant. This is the governor of that place. The governor of that place. Huh? Today, as soon as a man gets a post, the first thing happens, now you have to go through him via his spokesman. You have to leave a message with his secretary. He becomes inaccessible to the public. 
When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa, so some young girls looked at him and they said, Al-an la tuhlabu lana mana 